Today's scripture reading comes from Luke 10, 25 through 37, and Matthew 9, 35 through 37. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Tina. Let's read aloud together our prayer of illumination. Father... You give us the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Come down, we pray, and feed your people who are gathered and who hunger and thirst for your word. Amen. So uh, if you've been with us, you know we've been in the Ten Commandments, and uh, if you're paying attention to the scripture reading that just happened, that was not the Ten Commandments. uh, We're taking a week break as we do every October, uh, to focus on what we call the Greater Atlanta Spotlight. So every year we do two, two special Sundays. In February we do a global uh, spotlight where we think and consider and pray about and get in the word about what is God doing around the world and how can we be a part, how are we a part of it, and how can we continue to be a part of it, and what's our heart posture in that. Uh, and then in October, we always take a break in, uh, from whatever series we're in, and we focus on what God's doing right here in the greater Atlanta area, uh, and even within our communities in the various places that we live. And uh, so we'll start back next week uh, into the Ten Commandment series that we've been walking through. If you haven't been with us for that, uh, jump in with us. It's been great. We've covered the first three commandments. Next week, we're going to go a little bit out of order We're going to actually go to the fifth commandment uh, about honoring your father and mother. And then in two weeks, we'll go to the Sabbath, which is actually the fourth commandment to honor the Sabbath. And there's this real uh, holy reason as to why we're doing this. It's because I really want Randy to preach on the Sabbath about honoring the Sabbath, and he's not available next week. So we're just going to swap. Um, And I hope that's okay. I hope hope the Lord is okay with us getting them out of order for a couple of weeks. But for this week, we're coming back to a passage that I went back and looked, and I thought, you know, I want to preach this passage again, and I feel like I just preached it, and in a way I did. It was last, uh, not even a year ago, last of November when I preached this passage. Before that, it was only like maybe two years previous when I had come to this very familiar passage that uh, even if you're not familiar with the Bible, if you haven't been in or around church, you've you've heard the term, the Good Samaritan. This is one of those that that I want us to come back, maybe not every year, I don't know that I'll do this every single year, but I want us to come back to this passage often. Because I think encapsulated in this teaching of Jesus, we have before us the nature of the kingdom of God. In the sense of what are we to be, how are we to be involved in the work of the kingdom? What does it look like? And coupled with what you just heard read, 
uh, from Matthew chapter 9 as well, and the nature of how Jesus saw people, how he sees people even now as he sits at the right hand of God the Father, and how we as a people, united to Christ as we are through faith, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, how we are to see people. And here's the key word for this morning, not just see them, but engage, engage. When I was a kid, I'm thinking I was probably second or third grade. Uh, I was at every Friday night in the town that I grew up in. This is what you would do. I was was at the, um, at my hometown's high school football game. Everyone gathered in in the, the hometown. Maybe you grew up in a similar situation where it truly was uh, very similar to the show or the movie Friday Night Lights. And all, everybody went to the games, and, but when you're a kid, you didn't watch the games. Back then, they, um, they let us go on the track. And down on the track, in front of all the stands, the kids would play their own football game with a little football, a little Nerf football, or sometimes even if we didn't have a football, with a little cup or something. And we would play the whole entire game, and the parents would sit up above, watch the game, but be able to keep an eye on their kids down on the track. Well, the game had ended, and I was trying to make my way back up uh, the steps to where my parents were sitting, and as I turned, I remember this so vividly, as I turned to go up the stairs, there was an elderly man coming down right right in front of me, and he missed a step and fell. He landed uh, on his hip, and he was in a great deal of pain, and as a young child, I I remember being so troubled by this, not only because I saw him fall and and, and, uh, be in pain, but because... I wanted to help him so badly, but didn't think I was the person to do it. I mean, I'm a little kid. What can I do? And and I remember having this this deep feeling of even, which is so odd in this scenario, and it shows you just how deep-seated this desire within me to please others is. I remember thinking, what will others think if me, this little boy who can't really help, tries to help? They'll laugh at me. Isn't that silly? Isn't that funny how we think about things like that? The perception that we may have, that how are others going to perceive us? And I remember being so dumbfounded because as I was processing all this and as my heart was going out to this elderly man, no one was helping. No, no other adults were coming along and trying to help him up. And I remember watching him and in my little brain, maybe it was only, maybe it was only 10 seconds. I don't know, but it felt like two minutes of watching this man struggle and no one helping no one was helping, and, and yet I wouldn't help either. And I watched, and my heart broke, but I never engaged. Eventually, someone did come to help and helped him back up on his feet, and, but I, I, it troubled me greatly. I went home that evening and the next day, and I don't know how many days thereafter thinking about that scenario, to the point to where even today, all these many years later, I still think about it. And it's seared into my brain, that, that image of seeing this man and me not doing anything, me not engaging. And I think it's a little bit of a picture of the bigger picture of how the church is to engage, but how we often don't. Let me give you three reasons very quickly. These aren't the three main points of the sermon, but three reasons as to why, um, I, I, there's many reasons, but three main reasons why we don't engage with those around us who are in need spiritually, physically, emotionally, whatever it may be. The first one is preoccupation. We're just busy. We know this. I don't don't have to belabor this point, but very few of us carry a schedule or carry a daily rhythm that allows for it some margin so that as we come across people who are in need, uh, in need of the gospel, in need of help tangibly in terms of some type of physical need or in need emotionally, we just don't have time for it. We're too busy. We're on the way. We're journeying. We've got things to do. We've got kids to pick up. We've got places to be. We've got business lunches to have. And all of those things are so good, but there's no margin. So we're preoccupied. The second one is perception, even as I just talked about it. Yes, how will people perceive me? And isn't it odd? Like maybe you've never thought about this, but sometimes, and maybe it's just me. I I don't know. But sometimes what keeps me from engaging is actually how will I be perceived? Isn't that interesting? That that the reason I don't engage with someone is because I'm worried about how I will be perceived. 
maybe by that person that I want to help or engage with, but, but just even by others who might see. And it's, just, it's just odd. But the other part of perception is not, and this one's even darker, it's not only how might I be perceived, but how we perceive that person. Meaning, if they're in grave need, physically even, in terms of perhaps they're on the streets or whatever it may be, we can convince ourselves that we don't need to intervene because they did something to deserve it. There's no reason to engage there because there's probably some type of addiction or something that led them to this and therefore they're not worthy of my mercy. And so we'll actually justify not engaging based on a presupposition or a perception that we have of the person. The third reason we don't engage, and it's really more uh, the, the summation of those two, and it's the heart posture that the Bible gives us so very clearly. And it hurts to admit it. But I see it in me. I see it in me, and I think... If we're honest, you'll see it in yourself as well. And it's what the Bible just uh, highlights. It takes a yellow highlighter and just, just illuminates our hearts to say this. The reason we don't engage is, cause, is because by nature, by default, we are compassionless. We don't carry with us a great deal of compassion. We are a people who, and this is the language of Scripture, and this is what Jesus did so brilliantly. We, we struggle to see with eyes of compassion. To see others with eyes of compassion. L- listen to, again, what was read for us there uh, at the end of the Scripture reading from Matthew chapter 9. This is just a snapshot of what we see from Jesus Time and time again, it says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Watch this. When he saw the crowds, what was his response? He had compassion for them. just want that to sit with us for just a moment. I mean, don't, don't read past that and go, yeah, well, okay, that's what Jesus does. He's compassionate. I get it. No, no, no. If we are Jesus' people, if we have been set out and marked out and set apart as those who have been married to Christ by faith, and we are united to him, then this is who we are. People of Jesus with the same eyes with the same heart, to see those around us and, and have compassion for them. Why? Because they are harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Do we see, do, ask yourself the question, do I see with eyes of compassion? Because here's the connection that we see in the Bible. When we see, when we watch Jesus' life, when we watch Jesus' teachings and the apostles' teaching, what we see is this, is that when we see with eyes of compassion, it, it begins to fuel within us hands of action and tongues of mercy. Eyes of compassion fuel, produce within us hands of action and tongues of mercy. Did you, did you see in, in this passage what Jesus, what, it, what Jesus is about? Let's read it again. It says, and Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages. Watch this. Teaching and proclaiming. There's the tongues of mercy. It's not just hands of action. And it's not just what he says. Because what does it say that he does next? Healing every disease and every affliction. So it's both. It's both and, not either or. He's engaged in such a way to where he's proclaiming as he engages with his hands to heal to bring renewal, to to meet the needs physically and emotionally of the people that he's engaging with. He's also uh, simultaneously proclaiming and teaching. A common uh, 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 illustration that I've used commonly over the years is this. Imagine that, um, that just follow me, this doesn't make sense, but 
Imagine that for whatever reason, I'm the only one that knows. I'm the only one who watched, uh, who looked at the weather forecast for today. And it's bright and sunny outside, so, but just imagine the weather was not good. And I knew, I was the only one that knew that there was a tornado, an F5 tornado coming straight for Johns Creek, straight towards the church. And my response is, well, I want to make sure to help others escape this. I want to have compassion upon them so that they would not be caught up in this horrific storm. And so my, I, I go one of two ways with it. The first way that I go with it is I just say, hey, guys, I looked at the forecast, and exactly 942 in two two minutes, there's going to be a huge tornado that comes straight for this building. And so here's what we need to do. We need to all figure out a way to get downstairs, to get to the lowest point, get into our basement to find safety. But then I don't do anything. I follow that statement up with, so let's continue looking in the Bible at Luke chapter 10 and, uh, and just keep going about my business. You would go, what just happened? What's, what's he talking about? Did, is he lying to us? Because he's not, he's, not do, he's not doing anything physically, but he's telling us. But what if on the other side, what if I didn't say anything at all? What if I didn't tell you anything? I didn't proclaim anything to you. I didn't tell you anything about the tornado. But all of a sudden, mid sentence And you watched me walk out and go to the basement. You would go, what was that all about? So I did something physically to be an example to you of what you should do and how we should engage and take ourselves to a place of safety, but I didn't tell you anything, or I tell you something, I don't do anything about it. The kingdom of God, the nature of the kingdom of God that Jesus modeled for us and lived so beautifully for us is that it's both. It's the proclamation of the good news of Jesus, while also demonstrating by hand, meeting the tangible needs, the physical, emotional, spiritual needs of those around us, and engaging and engaging and engaging and engaging. Eyes of compassion fuel hands of action and tongues of mercy. This is who we are to be as Jesus' people. And so what, what's one of the most uh, powerful stories? I think the most powerful story that we could ever read and learn from on this note, I think it's the Good Samaritan story. It's familiar, yes, but don't let the familiarity of it breed uh, laziness towards it. Don't don't go, yeah, I know this, and so I'm going to be indifferent and check out at this point. No, re-engage with it. Let the Scriptures teach you again and again and again and remind you who we are to be in Christ. So he tells this story that we had read for us just a moment ago. And there's three, three key questions in this story that just are there for us in the text. This lawyer comes up to Jesus. And he asked Jesus a question that we all ask. If not verbally, if not literally, we ask it in our hearts. He asked a very common question to man, and it's this. What must I do to inherit eternal life? This is the nature, this is the question that is at the very core of the nature of the human experience. If we believe that there's a God, if we believe that there's a higher power, then the natural question is, therefore, what do I have to do to get to him? How do I get there? What's required of me? And you would think that Jesus at this point might very well say, and appropriately so, based on the rest of his teaching and the teaching of the Bible, there's nothing you can do. It doesn't matter what you do, actually. It doesn't matter how hard you try to be good and moral and kind and treat others the way that you would want to be treated and go to church and so forth. Uh, It doesn't matter what you do. It's never going to be enough because you, at the heart of who you are, are sinful and sin separates you from God. And so that's why I'm here. Jesus would say. That's why I'm here, is to rescue you from your sin and to perform for you morally, fulfilling the law such that you then believe upon me as your substitute. You you would think he could have said that there, and we would have gone, yes and amen, gospel of grace. Love it. But he does something different. As Jesus often does, he doesn't do what we think he might do or should do. He actually takes the anvil, the huge weight of the law. We've been studying the Ten Commandments. We, we're learning this, right? That the, the commandments actually show us the heart of God and what's required of us while also crushing us at the same time to show us that we can't do it and we need a Savior who will do it for us. And then once we're united to that Savior, we actually have his heart within us that we can do what's required of us, not because we have to, but because we want to. 
And so what he's doing with this young lawyer is he's, he's crushing him with the law. Because what does he say in response? He says, what must I do to in- inherit eternal life? How do I get to, to God? He says, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer responds correctly. He actually gives the right answer. Verse 27, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. he's, He's quoting exactly what Jesus will quote later in Matthew 22 when he says this is the summation of the law. He's quoting the great commandment from Deuteronomy and from Leviticus where he just says, look, it's love, love the Lord your God perfectly and love your neighbor perfectly. If you do that, then you'll inherit eternal life. Now, subtext, you can't do it. It's what, it's what the standard is. It's what's required, but you can't do it. But watch Watch how the lawyer responds. So Jesus says, you, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Be perfect. Achieve the law perfectly and you'll live forever. This is how confused the lawyer is about his own morality, his own goodness. He thinks he can actually do it because watch, watch the question that he asks. Here's the second question. Who's my neighbor? It, the The pretext is, desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In other words, the lawyer is actually considering, depending on how you answer this question, Jesus, I think I might might be doing this perfectly. I mean, I love people pretty well. So who, who exactly is my neighbor, Jesus? So Jesus comes with the um with the uppercut. Because he tells a story here, a parable that um, the lawyer hates. (laughs) And we kind of hate it too. Because he takes takes the most hated person, type of person from the Jews. The Jews Jews hate the Samaritans in every facet. Ethnically, racially, spiritually, they're, they're half-breeds in every category. And they're hated by the Jews. And Jesus makes him the hero of the story as one who loves his neighbor well. And the, again, the subtext of that story is to, to just point to the very epicenter of the heart of the lawyer. For the lawyer to be able to see, I don't, I don't love neighbor the way that God requires. I love people who are easy to love. I love people who are like me. I love people who believe what I believe. But the people that aren't like me, the people that I see as enemies, the people that I see as different from me, the people that I see as those who um, in every way would be in opposition to me, I, I certainly, I don't see them as my neighbor and I certainly don't have compassion upon them and I certainly don't love them. There's three key characters in this short story Jesus tells. First, it's the priest. The setting is that there's this road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and you see my hand going down. That's because Jerusalem is 3,000 feet above sea level. Jericho is 1,000 feet below sea level. So this road is a treacherous road that still exists today through the Judean desert uh, that with, has lots and twists and turns and is a very steep decline, but it was a road commonly traveled. Some people have even called it, back in that day, they would call it the, uh, the journey of blood because so many times robbers and thieves would wait in the many crevices and caves and turns and twists of the road to pounce and, and take what they wanted from the travelers. So the, the thought of there being someone laying on the side of the road half dead would be like, okay, well, that happens on this road. And so it's in this setting that there is a man in Jesus' story who's there, beaten practically to death, presumably by robbers who have come before, and up walks a priest. Now, priests, is, priests were descendants of Aaron, meaning they had the pedigree of godliness. They were to be the, holy, the holiest of, of people. They served in the temple. They were the ones that did the work of God. And it says that, don't miss this in the text, it says that he, the, the priest saw him. It's not that he didn't see him. 
It's not that he was so busy reading his scriptures that he never saw the guy. No, he saw him. And it says that he passed by on the other side. He didn't walk over and see if he was breathing. He didn't get anywhere near him. He passed by on the other side. Now, in his defense, you might say, well, priests had to stay clean in order to, uh, according to the ceremonial law that we see in Leviticus, they had to stay clean in order to continue to perform their services in the temple. And so he presumed that the guy was dead, and he knew that if he touched the guy, then he would be unclean. And for two weeks, he would have to go through cleansing rituals and ceremonies to be clean again so that he could, so he would be two weeks out of a job if he touches this guy. Don't you understand? That would be really logical as to why he passed on by. You can You can go that route, but Jesus didn't go that route. What Jesus is commonly doing with the religious mind of the day is saying, look, all the things that you've put in place, and yes, from God's word, I'm I'm here to say that when it comes to compassion, we don't become legalists. We actually let our compassion override the legalism of our hearts. We move towards people even when we have reasons not to. You hear that? We move towards people even when we have legitimate reasons not to. But he passed by on the other side. And so, so what happens next? Well, a Levite comes. And a Levite, they're they're descendants of, makes sense, Levi. And they also help the priest in the service of the temple. And they too are revered among the people as godly. And so you go, okay, well, the priest, man, the priest didn't, uh, didn't stop, but surely the Levite will. But it just quickly says that the Levite also saw him and just like the priest passed by on the other side. And then there's this third person. And the listeners of Jesus' teaching, I want you to imagine that you're there. You're standing there watching or sitting, watching Jesus preach. And tell this story. And you're hearing him tell this story to the lawyer. And when he says the word Samaritan, you cringe inside. Because you go, there's no way. He is not about to make the Samaritan the hero of this story. But then the Samaritan walks up. Watch the language shift. Verse thirty. Verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, everything's the same so far. Everything's the same. Journeying along, going about his way. When he saw him, so far, everything's the same. Priest, Levite, Samaritan. Journeying, see him. Here's where it shifts. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Remember what I said earlier. What do we learn from Scripture? That eyes of compassion fuel hands of action and tongues of mercy. Watch what happens. He engages. He engages. That word journey is important. This Samaritan isn't just walking along leisurely. He's going somewhere. He's journeying. He's moving in a direction. But presumably he creates margin to be able to engage. Because it says he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, in other words, he spent the rest of the day tending to this man. Because it says in the next day, it wasn't in a couple of hours later, once he got this man settled in the inn, He went about his journey. No, no, he spent the rest of the day tending to this man. It was not a part of his plan. It wasn't in the GPS to do this. The next day, he took out two denarii, a day's wage, so two days' wages, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Did you catch the last part? When I come back, I'm invested here. 
I'm putting him in the care of you, innkeeper, and here's some money to be able to take care of him. And I'll come back this way. And when I do, I'm going to stop and see how he is. He's invested now in this new relationship because his heart of compassion led him to have hands of action and words of mercy. He's talking to the innkeeper. Now, he could have easily, he could have very easily said, now why is this guy lying half dead on the side of the road? I wonder if he picked a fight. I wonder if it was his fault, actually. I mean, he is kind of a rugged guy. I bet I bet he let his mouth get in trouble, get him in trouble, and I bet, I bet he probably deserved this. You know, he could have gone that route, but he didn't ask questions. He was led by the Holy Spirit to engage. So Jesus asked the third critical question of the text. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And in this real conversation that really happened 2,000 years ago, I like to imagine that this lawyer very reluctantly, perhaps with gritted teeth, perhaps with a little bit of a mumble because he didn't want it to be clear and loud, said, the one who showed mercy. The one who showed mercy. He couldn't even utter the name Samaritan. He couldn't say, well, it was the Samaritan who showed mercy. He just said the one who showed mercy. When Jesus tells parables, one of the great, one of the, uh, one of the ways that we we must understand parables, whenever Jesus tells these stories, there's always one overarching takeaway important for us to remember when we're trying to dissect parables and we're trying to say, well, he's saying this and he's saying this and he's saying this. And he's, there's always one overarching primary point that Jesus is making. One application, one point. And in this one, it's easy. He tells us. There's one takeaway in this text, one command. And it's the very end of the text. Jesus simply looks at the lawyer and he says, you go and do likewise. You go be a Jesus person. Why would I say that? You go and be a Jesus person. Well, because we have to consider why would we go and do likewise? And not only why would we go and do likewise, how? You've already told us, Jesus, that it's impossible. We can't do this perfectly. We can't, if the standard is to, live, to love God perfectly and to love neighbor perfectly, then I'm, I'm going to be continually crushed under the standard of the law. Where is there any hope? Go and do likewise is only possible when we consider this, that Jesus, Jesus, and this is the twist of the application, Jesus is the true great Samaritan. Not just the good Samaritan, the great Samaritan. Because I want you to consider how Jesus actually does some things here in the rest of his life and story that is even greater than what the Good Samaritan did. Think about it. Proverbially, I can't even say that word, proverbially, metaphorically. Ephesians 2 tells us that we were dead in the trespasses of our sins in which we once walked. So the picture that we get, this metaphorical picture, is that every single one of us, born into sin as we were, we hated God. And so spiritually speaking, we're not just half dead on the side of the, of the road. We're dead. We have no hope. And like the Good Samaritan, Jesus, the Great Samaritan, comes upon us, so to speak, and he looks at us and he sees us with eyes of compassion. He looks upon us, and he he says, they're like sheep without a shepherd, and, and I have compassion upon them. And what does his compassion compel? Well, it compels action. And what does he do? He comes to us in mercy. 
He condescends even from the throne of heaven, from the glorious array and splendor of all that is his as the eternal son of God. And he leaves all of that to come and engage with the people who are his enemies. Why? Because he sees us and he has compassion upon us. But secondly, what did the Good Samaritan do? The Good Samaritan, having compassion, moves towards this man, beaten as he was. And what does it say that he does? It says that he pours out oil and wine upon his wounds to bring healing. And what do we see in Jesus? This great Samaritan is that he doesn't pour pour out oil and wine upon us. He pours out his very blood upon us to heal us from our wounds and from our transgressions to bring about a healing that we can never bring about ourselves, but only through the spilled, poured out blood of Jesus. What does the Good Samaritan do? The Good Samaritan puts this man uh, on his animal and he carries him to a place of safety. And he says, take care of this one. And I'll pay all of his debts. What does Jesus, the great Samaritan, do? Well, he he doesn't put us on an animal. He puts us on himself, the Lamb of God. And he carries us not to an innkeeper, but to the Father himself. And he says, take care of this one. And I'm paying for all of his debts. Whatever cost this one has incurred, you put it on me. And then what does the Good Samaritan say? The Good Samaritan says, take care of him until I come back. What does Jesus, the great Samaritan, say? Father, this one's yours, not just now, but for all of eternity. And all these wounds that we're dealing with now, I will come back and make sure that he is fully healed. Jesus is our great Samaritan, and so to be Jesus' people is to be like him, not just in that we want to be like him, but we're married to him. I said last week, everything in the Christian faith comes back to this doctrine of being united to Jesus. We are one with him if you've placed your faith in Christ. And so in our unity with him, we actually don't just want to be like him, we actually have the power to be like him. We can actually see people with eyes of compassion the way that he sees people with eyes of compassion. And we can engage. This is what we long to do, where we live, work, and go. On your way out today, I, um, I want you to pick up one of these, maybe more than one. These are just these little kind of almost transparent little tags that we have here. And on the bottom of it here, I want you to I want you to take one or two and I want you to do two things. I want you to ask the question to yourself that I'm asking you now. Who is God calling me to engage with around me? Who is he calling me to um, where I live, work, and go to, to move towards, to see with eyes of compassion? Maybe, only write first names. So maybe there's an individual right now, you know God saying, I want you to move towards them. Maybe it's a literal neighbor in your neighborhood. Maybe it's someone at work. You know. But the second thing is, if, if you go, I'm not sure who, then ask where. Where do you go often? And just write that down, you know, gymnastics place. What do you call that? Gym. There we go. That works. Ball fields. You know, coffee shop. Whatever. Just write a place down because you're not really sure who yet the Lord is saying, here, engage here with them. But you just, you just want to have eyes ready. You want to be where you normally are and say, God, who, who, who here are you calling me to engage with? And what you're going to do is you're going to write that down. We have Sharpies. We have these out, out there. And we have Sharpies. You're going to write it down. Then you're going to take it under the, out there in the atrium. The, we have those screens that are displayed on the walls. Under those, we have this, this place where you can pin these up. You can just put them, put them there. Pin them up. 
And here's what I want you to consider. What I love about this picture that's going to be out there is this. Each of us are writing something down individually because each of us are being called individually to engage with those around us. But once you see it up on the board, you're going to see that this is a collective endeavor. It's not just an individual endeavor. I can't just do this. I can't care about everyone. I don't have the capacity to do that. I can't engage with everyone. No one has that capacity. But together as a church, collectively, corporately, we can do that. I want you to think about it from the standpoint of an aircraft carrier. We're all sent out on mission together to be the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus, but we all gather back here collectively uh, to eat. Uh, Aircraft carriers, they call them floating cities. They have everything. They come back for nourishment, for fellowship, for community, for sleep, for rest, and then they are sent back out. So it's individual and it's corporate. And I think this wall is going to show that. We've each written down something individually, but this is a corporate endeavor. We pray for one another. We come alongside one another. We engage together. Lastly, very quickly, we started with Matthew 9. And I only read to you verses 35 and 36. We'll close with verse verse 37. I want you to pray. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You're the laborer. The harvest is your city. When we talk about city impact, this is all we're talking about. We're talking about people being on mission together, serving the people around, engaging the people around with the eyes of Jesus, fueling eyes of compassion, fueling hearts of action, tongues of mercy. Father, would you help us do that? Would you help us be a people that engage those around us in the, in the same way that Jesus so very faithfully did so in his ministry upon the earth, but even bigger than that, the way that he, with unthinkable compassion, engaged us, saved us even. And so help us as we consider the greater Atlanta area and our Everything is close to us as our neighbors and our communities all the way up into our cities and the greater city of Atlanta. Would you, would you use us? Use us as your people, Jesus' people, with great eyes of compassion, hands of action, and tongues of mercy. Do it, O oh God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing together. You've been listening to the Perimeter Church Sermon Podcast. Perimeter Church is located at the corner of Highway 141 and Old Alabama Road in Johns Creek, Georgia. Please visit our website at www.perimeter.org for more information, to give us your feedback, and to find other sermons from our teaching team. Thanks for making this podcast a part of your day.